Luke chapter 12, verses 32 through 40. Do not be afraid, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give alms. Make purses for yourselves that do not wear out. An, an unfailing treasure in heaven, where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Be dressed for action and have your lamps lit. Be like those who are waiting for their master to return from the wedding banquet, so that they may open the door for him as soon as he comes and knocks. Blessed are those slaves whom the master finds alert when he comes. Truly I tell you, he will fasten his belt and have them sit down to eat, and he will come and serve them. If he comes during the middle of the night or near dawn and finds them so, blessed are those slaves. But know this, if the owner of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have let his house be broken into. You also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an unexpected hour. It was late one night. The family was all tucked in bed. The dog and the cat, the husband and the wife, and the three-year-old son. Late night, and all of a sudden, a big storm came in, and a storm came in, and suddenly there was a loud clap of thunder. And the cat and the dog, they went under the bed. The three-year-old, who was sleeping in his own room, suddenly burst forth from the door and through the door into Mom and Dad's room and did what every three-year-old does, jumped in bed, crawled under the covers. And as he crawled under the covers, he said, Daddy, What makes all that noise? The father, who was half awake and half asleep, said, "That's, that's God, son. He's making it rain so the trees, all the trees and all the flowers will grow. Well, that settled the little boy down for just a few moments, and suddenly there was another loud clap of thunder. And he woke from underneath those covers and In a little small voice, he whispered, Daddy, what's the name of that guy again? What's the name of that guy again? You see, around here on Sunday mornings, we spend a lot of time singing these great hymns and and reading these scriptures in praise of that guy, in praise of the name of God. You see, the Bible makes a really big thing about the fact that God has a name. Did you ever notice that? Lots of names, actually. But God has a name. We modern folks, we're tempted to reduce God to some sort of concept or some vague experience out there, but God is too often oversimplified. To be the highest and best aspirations of humanity or simplified to be simply a primitive way of thinking about morality or simplified as an expression of the experience of when we're alone with our thoughts. But when we pray the Lord's Prayer, when we pray the Lord's Prayer, we say something very different from all of that. We say that God is personal We say that God is alive and acts. We say that God has a name, a name. We say, hallowed be thy name. Say it with me. Hallowed be thy name. That's almost poetic, if you will. The the hallowed be thy name. We say that in the Lord's Prayer. Remember when God appeared to Moses in the burning bush? Remember that story? God appeared to Moses in the burning bush, and and Moses says when he encounters this bush that's engulfed in flame but not truly burning, he says, who are you? Who are you? Who am I supposed to say has sent me when I return to the Israelites? Who are you? You see, Moses realizes that, that he is not in the presence of a great concept here, okay? He is face to face with a peculiar God who acts in peculiar ways. 
This God had heard the cry of the oppressed people. This God had not only heard the cry of the oppressed people, this God now has chosen to act. This God is bigger, bigger than all the kings of the earth, bigger than even Pharaoh. This God chose strange and unskilled folks. He chose strange and unskilled folks like, like Moses. Moses, folks like these, he chose to, to shake up the rich and the powerful, the kingdoms, the, to shake up the palace, if you will. So Moses asked, who are you? Who are you? Are you a concept like liberation? Are you a concept like self-esteem or, or freedom? Are you a great concept like justice? And how does God answer? <laughs> the first answer is a real puzzler. He says, I am who I am or I will be present to whom I am present. You see, this God creates his own identity. This God is not going to be jerked around by every human cry and need and desire. This God is sovereign. This God is free. This God is untamed. This God is compassionate. This God is holy. Holy God. And once Moses hears God's name, the Scripture records that Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. He hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. Who of us would not also hide our face? Would not also hide our face if we found out that God's ways were not our ways? We found out that, that God is not the patron of the powers that be of Pharaoh. Who of us would not hide our face if we didn't realize, maybe for the first time, that, that God is not safely locked up in heaven? That God is actually loose on this earth, disrupting things day after day after day, the status quo. Who of us would not also hide our face? Like Moses, we weren't able to look at the great holiness of God. And yet because God has, has given his, his name, every creature bows to him. Every creature bows to him. Since God reigns in heaven and on earth, God's name is hallowed. And every creature will bow to him. The blue whale, the mockingbirds, every woman, every child, every man. But if we don't know God's name and that God's name is hollow, we do not know how to worship God. If we don't know God's name and that God's name is hollow, we, we don't have a clue how to worship God. We will live in conflict with ourselves because we were created, you and I, every human being, was created for no greater purpose than to praise God. St. Augustine said it this way, because you, were because you made us for yourself, speaking to God, our hearts find no peace until they rest in you. Our hearts will find no peace until they rest in you. The fact that we do not know how to rightly praise God is pretty obvious. We have restless hearts. Just read the headlines. Just watch the morning news. All the disarray and disconnectedness. Our sin is shown in all the sins that we live out, the killing, the stealing, the mayhem, the, the meanness of relationships. I don't know how many of you are on Facebook. A lot of you are, I know that. But if you read Facebook in this day and time, you're going to see a lot of meanness out there right now. Any social media. Meanness. All showing our disconnectedness from our worship of God. You see, we were created to praise God and to aboundingly enjoy God, yet we attempt to secure ourselves by ourselves. We fail to acknowledge that God has bestowed meaning on us. He's bestowed meaning on us simply by God's willingness to be our Father. All creation is meant to hallow the name of God. In the Lord's Prayer, we learn to hallow the name of God and when we do that, we learn to rightly praise God. 
Everything exists, exists to praise God's name. Therefore, none of us lives unto ourselves. None of us is just a man or just a woman or just an accountant or just a housewife. None of us is alone to ourselves. When we pray our Father, we're, we're watching our fate be transformed into God's good desire. Our fate is being transformed into God's good desire. We are counting for something in the larger scheme of things when we pray this prayer. We are enjoying ourselves being caught up in a larger adventure. This prayer teaches us that in everything we are to hallow the name of God. In everything we're about, every moment of our lives, every word we say, every breath we breathe, we are to hallow the name of God. And when we do, we discover who we truly are. In praying the Lord's Prayer, God sanctifies us. God sets us apart. God ordains us. God makes us holy. We are sent to live our lives in such a way as to make visible to all the world that our holy God now reigns that God has a rightful claim on all creation, and that God has regained rightful territory from the enemy. And who's that rightful territory? What's that rightful territory? You and I are the rightful territory that he has claimed. He has claimed it every time we pray this prayer and say, Hallowed be thy name. Closely related to hallowed be thy name is the phrase, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. The fitting response to the holiness of God is our honoring of God's name in all that we say and all that we do. Our worship of God is always linked to ethics. Let me say that again. Worship is not an isolated event that you do for one hour on Sunday morning, by the way. Our worship of God is always linked to our ethics always linked to our ethics. You see, ethics are life lived in the light of the holiness of God. Life lived in the light of the holiness of God. That is what ethics is all about. Sometimes we Christians, though, believe something different than that. We get confused about what that all means. We, we believe something like this, that Christianity is mostly a matter of just trying to do the right thing and live a good life. Well, when we believe that way, we're sort of getting the cart about a mile in front of the horse, which means it doesn't work. You see, Christianity mainly is not a matter of what we do or how we live. Christianity is first a matter of what God in Christ has done for every one of us. That's where we have to start from. Knowing what God in Christ has done for every one of us. You see, we have no idea how to live. We have no idea how to live faithfully until we know who God is. And when we say that God's name is holy, that tells us how we ought to live as well. Knowing the Creator tells us where the creation is actually moving toward. So how do we get to know this Creator? We begin with prayer. We learn to pray these simple words. At least that's how they first appear. We learn to pray in this way, Jesus says. Learn to have your life bent in this way. And then you'll know how to live. Christians know no distinction between worship and ethics. It's all tied together. Our moral life is shaped by our worship. This dynamic plays out in Scripture over and over again. A passage from 1 Peter reads this way, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people. And then it goes on. You're all that in order that you may proclaim the mighty acts of him who called you out of the darkness into the marvelous light. You're all these things, but not, it doesn't end there. It's in order that you and I might proclaim these mighty acts in him who called you out of darkness 
into the mighty light. It's all for you can proclaim. See the connection? We've been chosen, we've been adopted, we've been ordained as God's own people in order that we might proclaim God's mighty acts in our words and our deeds each and every day. You see, the Lord's prayers were like a firecracker. Sometimes in the middle of the sermon, we need a firecracker to go off in here. A firecracker waiting to go off in church, waiting to explode. And when it explodes, it's going to demolish the temples of all the false gods that vie for our attention. It may have slipped past you all these years. But any time you make this statement, hallowed be thy name, holy be your name, we have made a revolutionary statement. A statement that will put us in conflict. That will put us in conflict with our culture. With the hedonism of our culture. It will put us in conflict with the idolatry of nationalism. It will put us in conflict with the, with the worship of ourselves and our rugged individualism. It will put us in conflict with the worship of all the assorted deities that compete for our attention each and every day. Giving your name to the God of Israel, who is to be hallowed in all we do, when you do that, the world's going to begin to see you as odd. The world's going to see you as weird sometimes. Our culture drives out those who do not know, not bow to the culture's idols and altars. Let me tell you a story I read a few years ago. It's about a student. It's about a student. He was in college, and one of his friends, one of his peers, offered him some drugs. And these were sort of the words he said. He said, go ahead and try it. It'll make you feel good. It'll make you feel good. Well, the student said no. He wasn't interested. And the other, his friend said, hey, hey, don't be so uptight, man. Isn't that the line, don't be so uptight? Don't be so uptight. Nobody's going to know that you tried a little dope. Just, just a little. Get a little high. And the student responded, that's not the point. That's not the point. The point is that my mother cleaned houses. She got down on her hands and knees and scrubbed floors to send me to college. I'm here because of her. I'm here for her. Now hear this. I would not do anything that would demean the sacrifice she made for me. That's why I said no. I would not do anything to demean the sacrifice that my mother made for me. What if we were so respectful and so in love with Jesus that every time a temptation came our way, we responded the same way? I would not do anything to demean the sacrifice that God has made for me. That comes real close to how we react to the holiness of God. Christians don't steal and don't cheat. We don't do those things to get on the good side of God or to earn merit badges, if you will, since Christ has already been made right. We've already been made right with God. We are called to live in the light of the knowledge of God's name, God's holy name. And when we live in the light of that knowledge, then our behavior follows, our ethics follow, our worship. In praying the Lord's Prayer, we are naming the holiness of God. We discover not just who God is, but also who we have been claimed to be. We are daily reminded that we are not our own. We belong not to ourselves. We don't even belong to our desires. We belong to God who created us. The Heidelberg Confession asks this question of Christians. It asks, what is your only comfort in life? and in death. And I invite you to join with me in the response. That I belong, body and soul, in life and in death, 
not to myself, but to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. You see, each of us has been named by God, whom we name in this prayer. We've been elected by God. We've been chosen by God. We've been ordained as priests to the world by God. We are owned. Every breath, every moment, every aspect of our life is owned. And so we now pray this prayer together. Please join with me. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.